Okay. So um, there really aren't any house rules. Uh, just be a genuine person, be a nice person. Um, uh, yeah, there, there, there really isn't any, uh, there, there is a section for rules. And of course, we make this a safe place. And just use your common sense about being a part of an online community. Um, the house rules really are a way for you to be a part of Mint Bean. So this is how, uh, this is more like an etiquette guide or a quick, um, a quick guide to how to use Mint Bean while you're over here to get better at development. First thing is say hello. We're a community. We're not a platform. We're not just a platform. We're a community. So introduce yourself in Discord. Be helpful to others, which is actually the core of what networking is. So be helpful to others. That's what networking comes down to. Um, and join a team. It's way more fun when uh, when you're in a team, even if you're even if you're a newbie. So what I'm trying to say is, um, Mint Bean is like this bonfire around which we're all situated, and we're gonna you know um, we're gonna toast some marshmallows and have a lot of fun uh, this week. But it's not going to work for you if you don't be if you if you don't involve yourself in the conversation. So I'm welcoming everybody over here to bring your own personality to the table and um, make friends and be a part of this amazing community that Mint Bean is uh, starting to become. Next thing is code until failure. So Mint Bean is like a gym. Okay, Mint Bean, when you come to Mint Bean, you're coming over here because you want to learn. This is not a tutorial video. This is not uh, lead code or hacker ink. This is more like, uh, this is way closer to a gym or a dojo, um, like a martial arts dojo or a sports club than anything else. So expect resistance. The way we structure Mint Bean is we will teach you stuff that you won't learn through tutorials, that you won't learn through anything other than actually coding on real projects. Uh, we're about as close to the workplace as it's going to get when it comes to building projects, because A, we have uh, a real project that you have to build, and B, yes, we set you up with a tutorial, we drive, we drive you through, you know, we show you the ropes, but C, um, you really have to learn how to Google solutions to problems you've never encountered before yourself. So you're going to be stepping into the unknown in a very gentle environment. Um, it's uh, for many of you who are newer, you're going to feel like uh, you're going to feel like you're kind of being pushed into the deep end. And I, I want you to try and embrace that failure. When surfers go and, you know, when surfers uh, surf those really big waves, when they wipe out, they, they kind of just roll with it and they kind of just go with the flow, literally. And they embrace their failure, and that makes sure that that, that keeps them safe. That that makes sure that if you if you just keep your body in ragdoll mode and don't stiffen up, that makes sure that you don't get hurt. And I'm asking everyone to embrace that kind of mentality where if you do wipe out and if you do come across hurdles, don't be hard on yourself, but don't quit. No matter what, don't quit. It's okay to fail, but don't quit until the very end. We have code mentors, we have a community Discord, and there are so many resources for you over here. I'm often available in the Discord channels. We have people available at all times. You don't even have to be here uh, during code mentor hour at all. Um, you, you can just ask a question and most of the time somebody's going to answer. My core team is also on Discord and they, ask, they answer questions, uh, technical questions as well. And there's no such thing as a bad question. We know everybody is a newbie. So even if it's something as simple as, hey, how does a for loop work? That's totally fine. And there's nothing wrong with questions like that. In fact, that's a great question. That means that you've tapped out. You're at the edge of your learning, at the edge of your knowledge, and you want to learn more. And Mint Bean is very welcoming. And we do not believe in bad questions. No such thing as bad questions. So make sure you use the resources that you guys have. Um, the other thing that I want you to um, realize about Midbean is that a hackathon is an opportunity. Uh, if you Google um, why are hackathons a great way to get hired, uh, you'll get a lot of responses. You, you'll get tons and tons of blog articles. And recruiters know that hackathons attract really smart developers. And you can find 
um, the, the kinds of developers who come to hackathons are, um, are sharp and are committed to learning. So just we, we brand this as a learnathon, but it absolutely is a hackathon. And um, this is an opportunity to attract recruiters to your profile. So talk about um, three things on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're not on LinkedIn, you need to get on LinkedIn. Otherwise, you're gonna get a tough. Uh, you're, you're gonna have a tough time getting hired. I'm sure um, your college <clears throat> or bootcamp um, or career coach has told you this, but you should definitely be on LinkedIn. Uh, I want everybody over here to talk about starting a hackathon on LinkedIn. Uh, if you fail, I want you to talk about your failure on LinkedIn and be okay with failing in public. Talk about what you learned at the end of the hackathon, and that's what matters. If you win, talk about winning on LinkedIn. If you finish, talk about finishing on LinkedIn. But I want you guys to talk about this hackathon on LinkedIn because it's going to attract recruiters to your profile. And um, if you do talk about this on LinkedIn, drop your message inside the Discord. Doesn't matter what channel, just pick a channel that seems appropriate and drop a message saying, hey, I just posted on LinkedIn. Can people upvote this, uh, this post and like and share and comment? And people generally do like, share, and comment if you ask them. So um, just talk about it on LinkedIn, drop your posts in the Discord, and we will help each other get uh, lots and lots of upvotes, um, get boosted on LinkedIn's algorithm, and get noticed by recruiters. So this is an opportunity. It's a massive opportunity, no matter what level you're at, even if you're still in boot camp or college, um, doesn't matter. Uh, make sure you show off on LinkedIn because it's it's kind of a big deal. Hackathons are a really big deal to recruiters. And the last thing is um, get involved. We want to keep Mint being free for everyone, but we can't do it alone and we need your help. Uh, we're going to have a town hall meeting today at 3 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be dropping, that's in about uh, an hour and a half to two hours. And uh, you can join that. Uh, keep an eye out on the community gardening channel. That's where the whole community gets together, uh, makes suggestions and builds, co-creates the community together. So join the town hall meeting today if you would like to get involved. And uh, what I do is I personally mentor code, mentor, uh, code mentors and um, we call it the DC. So the Dev Collective is the inner circle of Mintbean. Um, if you get involved with the Dev Collective, I will personally see to it that you get the career and technical mentorship that you need um, in return for your getting involved and helping the community at large. Uh, ways to get involved are you can start a book club, you can start um, an open source project, you can teach other people in a workshop, uh, you can become a code mentor. Um, if you have new ideas that haven't been, um, that I haven't listed over here, bring up those new ideas. Um, some of the perks that uh, Dev Collective members get, and this is, a, this is totally free, this is kind of um, a, a volunteer barter thing where I, I make sure that it's worth your time. Uh, some of the things that uh, Dev Collective members get, we have a job hunt club, um, we have where everybody applies to jobs together and um, links to junior developer jobs across the US and Canada are shared. Um, in that um, in that session, so so it becomes really easy to start applying for jobs and keep up to date with your job search. So a job hunt club is one of the perks. Uh, another perk is um, we have open source projects that we're building, and you can get involved in those open source projects and and get mentorship from me and my team on a technical basis. Um, we have a DevRel club that's starting up, and I'm really excited about that. So if, if you're interested in dev advocacy and, and developer relations, uh, it's kind of a mix between teaching, marketing, and development. Uh, it's a new career path. We're starting up a DevRel club, and that's going to be another way for you to get involved. But these clubs are only, only available to Dev Collective members. And there are other, um, if you would like to create a, a, a club for the greater community, um, then, then that's a way for you to get access to the exclusive clubs as well. So that's, uh, that's kind of a few different ways for you to get involved. It's a great way to make friends. It's a great way to network. And it's also a great thing to put on your resume. If you're create, if you created a club, um, for example, Akira, uh, from the community, Akira brand created a JavaScript 30 club. She's in the dev collective now. So they were doing West Boss's JavaScript 30, uh, every single week as a group. It's almost like a book club, but for JavaScript coding. Um, so yeah, get involved. This is your opportunity to make, um, a bunch of friends, uh, um, 
who are like-minded and who are um, who are looking to get hired and get their first jobs just like you. Uh, that's pretty much all I have for house rules. Um, if anybody has any questions, please drop them in chat. I would love to address your questions uh, in a second, but I'm going to move on um, to talking about today's challenge and walking you through the example project that we have to get, uh, put together for you guys and also starting to give you a tutorial on PhaserJS and how to actually work with PhaserJS. Um, this is gonna be a really high value session. It's going to take probably another half hour to an hour, um, probably going up to the hour mark, to be honest. Uh, stay as long as, uh, as you can. I highly suggest you stay over here because we're changing the format a little bit. Um, the Kanban board, where we found that people find it a little intimidating, so we're we're skinning it up a little bit. Um, instead of the Kanban board, we're going to be doing a tutorial right on the opening ceremony itself. So that's what's happening over here. The tutorial is going to be a code walkthrough, and I'm going to to attempt to build a, a feature um, right in front of you guys, and. We'll, we'll we'll play with the code and um, I'll play with the code and it'll be kind of like a, a kind of like a code along in a way where I show you how to work with PhaserJS based on a template. So if you uh, haven't been to the Mintbeam platform yet, and uh, yeah, Contra, yeah, man, uh, I, I played so much Contra as a kid. So if you haven't been to Mintbeam.io yet. Um, uh, make sure you find your way to mintbean.io. And um, are you, do you guys see the Mintbean platform? Do you guys see the mintbean.io website? Yeah? OK, great. And uh, click login on the top right and type in your password and log in. And in the upcoming section, you'll see how to code an action game is, uh, is live right now. And it says live on the left, you'll see the Kanban, you'll see resources, you'll see project gallery, et cetera. I'm an admin, so you're kind of seeing slightly different, uh, a slightly different view. You know what, let me, let me log in with, the, with my user. So um, let's see. Oh man, I, I really hope that LastPass fixes up there-ish because it's still so clunky. Okay, here we go. So you're gonna you're gonna see this page right here. Uh, click register on the right, and you'll have registered. At that point, you can share um, your ticket for how to code an action game on LinkedIn, Twitter, Reddit, etc. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna click Twitter and I'm just gonna tweet it out, and that's gone on Twitter. And I'm gonna tweet it out on LinkedIn as well. Well, not tweet it out on LinkedIn. I'm gonna send it out on LinkedIn as well. Um, and I'll just share it in a post. Um, hosting today's hackathon. Hi, everyone. Mintbean um, for life. Um, I don't know if I should put this on LinkedIn. Should I put it on LinkedIn? Nah. LinkedIn doesn't like doesn't like super quirky stuff. Um, post. And that's it. So that's, that's how easy it is to post um, the fact that you're attending a hackathon on LinkedIn and Twitter. After you're done with that, go over to Kanban and click Unlock a Kanban Guide. And when you click that, you're going to see the Kanban. You can read through all of the tickets yourself. Uh, there's information on how to get involved, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to go down to clone uh, the repo. And I'm going to click the repo link. And here's the code. I'm going to Command C and go over into a terminal. I've already cloned it down, but here's where you can clone it on your local. So go ahead and clone that. You can also fork it. So if you fork it, um, uh, you, it'll, it'll just create a clone repo for you on your GitHub. So you can either fork it or clone it. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just continue working with the project that I have over here. Uh, inside my VS code. So I'm going to first do npm start. And that'll serve the project on localhost 1234. Localhost 1234. 
And here's my uh, little action game that's not complete yet. And the little white ball is me. I can move around on the white ball. And I can also shoot bullets. Um, it's lagging right now because it's in dev mode, but it kind of clears up in live mode. And there are a couple of bugs that I've left in there, partially because I couldn't get around to it, but also because I wanted to talk about PhaserJS and its update model. So um, I can I can shoot these uh, shoot these bullets from my player one, and I can float around a little bit. I can jump around, but as you can see, there there are there are issues where there's lag going on, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the project from the bottom up. And I'm going to walk you up to the place where there is the bug. And we're going to talk about every single layer of the project and how the project works, how the bundler works. Um, I'll be going through uh, semi-theoretical stuff about bundlers and about um, PhaserJS. A uh, quick question, uh, is there anything specific that anybody wants me to cover? Put it down in chat. Um, and if there's, uh, if there's any, any specific issues that anybody's having in understanding what I'm saying, if you don't understand what the concept that I'm going over, um, just drop it in Zoom chat. I have my eyes open on Zoom chat. It's right here. And I'm going over the project on my other screen. So I have my eyes on Zoom chat. Let me know if you have any questions. So after you've cloned, here's what your, um, here's what your folder structure is going to look like. You have source. Inside source, you have lifecycle and objects. Inside objects, you have ball and bullet. Inside lifecycle, you have create, preload, update. And you have index, you have world, you have constants. Then you have your package JSON, and you have readme.md. So pretty straightforward structure. Uh, one thing that I learned, uh, the, uh, I, I learned while working in the industry, I've been working as a full stack developer for almost 10 years now. And one thing that I learned in the industry is if you want to understand a project, you, you have to start with, this, with a place where its dependencies and its run scripts are placed. So in JavaScript, in Node.js, that's package.json. Now, if you look at Java, that's your Palm XML if you're using Maven, your Gradle scripts if you're using Gradle. Um, but you know, in, in package.json, um, this is where in JavaScript you place all your dependencies, and it's also where you get your start scripts. So the way I like um, reading projects is I start with package.json always. And then I kind of go over, the first time I look at a, a package, I ignore dev dependencies, I ignore dependencies, I go right over to scripts, and I want to know how it is that you even start the project. And that gives me the entry point. For, for the code. So this is kind of like walking through the front door. So package.json is your JavaScript project's front door. So I've just walked through it and it says start, parcel, serve, index HTML. Now parcel, parcel is a bundler. Uh, who doesn't know what a bundler is? Uh, anybody doesn't know what a bundler is? Okay, one person doesn't know, two people don't know, okay? Um, who doesn't know, um, okay, who, who knows bundlers and their purpose? Who, who understands bundlers entirely? Not, okay, I don't, I'm not seeing many people who understand bundlers entirely. Okay, good. So I'm gonna go into, okay, Julio only kind of knows, Christian's, Christian doesn't know. Okay, great, perfect. So I'm going to walk through what a bundler is, and I'm going to kind of give you um, a, a small insight into what bundlers do and how they help us. Um, now, everybody knows that inside index.html, uh, you can add script tags. And script tags are what actually get run um, when, uh, when, when your browser loads up your HTML. The script tag is what gets loaded, and whatever is inside a script tag gets run. Now, um, in the very, very beginning of web development, you didn't even have scripting. You, I believe you only had HTML and CSS. Uh, I don't even think you had CSS. This is the 90s we're talking about, possibly the 80s, uh, before my time, definitely. And um, over time, 
the web started getting more featureful. So you started getting HTML, you, you started getting CSS, and you started getting JavaScript. And um, these three file types, HTML, JS, CSS, um, those, uh, th those file types basically got loaded into the browser and got run. Uh, they, were, they were all human readable files. Um, all of them were written so that humans could read them and humans could write them. So it was written for developers and it was interpreted by the browsers. So you would have very basic HTML files and JavaScript files and CSS files. Um, this is something that a lot of you guys have dabbled with. So, um, oh, I, I was born in the late 80s. So it's not like, you know, don't feel too old. It's just before my time as a professional developer. So I didn't code in the 90s at all. Um, I wish I did now, but I didn't. I didn't see the uh, beginning of uh, web development. But um, coming back to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, um, it was all really simple in the beginning. And it was super simple. But then people started wondering, well, how do I um, automatically reload my page when my JavaScript gets updated? And you started getting these uh, live reload scripts. They, they would watch your JavaScript, um, your HTML, and your CSS. And they, they might automatically reload. I don't even think you had automatic reload. Um, you used to have automatic reload as part of um, certain IDEs, but even then, um, it, it, was, it was just really uncommon to have any kind of interactivity. Uh, fast forward a few years, and um, you start getting Node.js coming into the scene, and Node.js changes the game entirely. So now Node.js can let you run JavaScript um, in your desktop, not just inside your browser, and that's a game changer. Um, that, lets, uh, that lets you use Node.js to build servers, to build uh, CLI scripts. That was not a thing um, in the old days of the web. So when Node.js came around, um, people wanted to take their Node.js scripts and make them available in the browser. And in order to do that, in order to take their Node.js scripts and make them available in the browser, uh, they, started, they, they started creating these things called bundlers. Um, you'll notice that inside index.js, I have a bunch of uh, requires. And requires are um, pretty common nowadays, but they were not common. Back when I started, they were not common at all. You used to you, know, you, you used to have to do all sorts of crazy stuff to get your code running in the browser. But this requires stuff uh, requires are enabled by bundlers. So one of the things that bundlers give you is they let you require stuff in the browser. Now Node.js lets you require stuff natively. That's not possible in the browser without using a bundler. So um, one of the things that a bundler gives you is the ability to use require in the browser environment, not just in the node environment. So that's one of the things that a bundler gives you. The other thing that a bundler gives you is uh, Node.js built this package.json thing that comes from Node.js actually, not from the browser. And in package.json, you can install dependencies. So what a bundler does is, is it takes your node dependencies wraps them up inside the browser and presents it to the browser for use. So a bundler has two purposes. One is take all of your, um, take all of your uh, uh, scripts, all of your dependencies, and make them available on the browser. And the second purpose is take all of your custom code and make that available in the browser as well and give, give one access to the other. So let your custom code have access to your dependencies. Um, Another, uh, you know, another way to think about this is their blender. So let me kind of um, paint a picture for us using a whiteboard. So, and it's going to be ugly. Sorry, guys. Uh, limitations of Zoom. So you have um, you have your npm depths, and sorry about my chicken scratch writing. You have your uh, CSS. I should just use text. Um, you have, I, I'm just gonna erase this. Uh, you have your NPM dependencies, you have your JS, CSS, HTML, and all of that, what a bundler does is it uh, blends it all together. And at the end, it outputs a bundle.js. And it also outputs various, um, 
uh, various asset files, for example, PNG, font, and you can also include um, PNGs and fonts, um, fonts, other assets, videos, etc. can also be handled by your bundler. And your bundler's responsibility is to make sure that all of that stuff is available in a way that your custom code, so your custom code has access to all of these um, all of these JS files, all of this PNG stuff. So that's what a bundler is. So coming back to any questions about bundlers, I hope I didn't lose anyone. Any questions about bundlers? Was that confusing? Was that too abstract? And I can kind of bring it down a notch and make it concrete. Would anybody like a concrete uh, walkthrough of parcel? I'm still a bit confused myself. Okay. Perfect. I'll do a I'll do a concrete walkthrough of parcel then, and that'll kind of bring uh, bring all of this together for a lot of people. So parcel bundler, um, parcel bundler is currently just serving, but I'm going to instead just do. I think that's what makes it build. Uh, building nope. Uh, parcel build. Index.html. So I, what I've told Parcel to do, Parcel is a bundler, and I've told Parcel to blend our project. And now what Parcel is going to do is it's going to build everything up together. It'll take maybe up to a minute or two to do this. Um, and it's going to drop everything into the disk folder. And the disk folder is going to have uh, index, uh, index.html. It's going to have our JavaScript file but the JavaScript file is going to be minified and uglified. OK, maybe not minified and uglified, but it's definitely going to be squished together so that you have about 400,000 lines of JavaScript. Uh, this includes all of your node modules. This includes your custom code. All of it gets included inside this squished together JavaScript file. And that squished together JavaScript file is then automatically included in your index HTML. So, what I'm showing you over here is stuff that you guys don't need to worry about. But for those who are curious, um, Parcel just took all of uh, just, to, just took our index HTML, saw that there was a dependency on index.js. Then it went into index.js. It saw that there was a dependency on phaser, on lifecycle create, preload, and update. Then it went into all of those files, and then it saw their dependencies and their dependencies and their dependencies. And it just took all of that. And, and magically, automatically just squished it together into a massive JavaScript file and a few things that you don't need to worry about. And now I can serve that dist folder like a static um, like, like a static project. Because guess what? It's a static project. Does that kind of explain more about what the bundler's role is? So this only applies to deploying. Explain explaining how it is bundling it into a neat package that can be e easily read. Yes, this only applies to deploying, but bundlers these days are very powerful. And they give you hot module reload. They give you server proxying. They give you a bunch of stuff um, that's not just about deployment. It's also something that you use for your local development. So it gives you live reload. It gives you module uh, hot module reload. And all of that stuff is enabled by your bundler. So the next time you, you do a create React app and you're wondering, hey, this is so cool. How does it know that my files are updated? Um, the answer is create React app depend, depends on Webpack, which is a bundler. And Webpack enables hot module reload. Webpack enables live reload. Webpack is the thing that does build when you do NPM, you know, when you do um, NPM run build for your create React app. It's actually Webpack doing most of the work. So this is kind of why I tell people, don't just depend on Create React App. Start working with bundlers, because bundlers are a core piece of your application. And if you ignore bundlers, you're going to stay at a, at a very junior level for a very long time. And bundlers are easy. They're relatively easy. Um, Parcel Bundler definitely is one of the easiest bundlers I've ever used, guys. There's no configs. Like If you notice, there's no Webpack config. There's no config files. There's nothing. It's just. All I have to do is install parcel, point it at index.html, and it 
automatically just scans index HTML, sees that there's source index JS. It also has support for TypeScript out of the box. Um, it has support for SAS out of the box. It has support for, oh, Snowpack is great too. Uh, it has support for so many things out of the box. Um, and Parcel used to be my all-time favorite. Nowadays, I prefer Snowpack and I'm looking at Snowpack, which is a new bundler, which is way faster than, Web, uh, than, than Webpack and um, uh, parcel. So I'm kind of looking at my options now and saying, oh, Snowpack looks good. There's also Rollup. And you guys don't need to know this, but the reason I'm saying these names is because um, I'm trying to get you guys familiar with JavaScript, the world of JavaScript that you might not have seen as a junior developer. So you have Rollup, you have Webpack, you have Parcel, you have Snowpack, uh, you have older stuff like Grunt and Gulp and Browserify. Um, and there are all these different bundlers that uh, came before that nobody uses anymore. And there are going to be more bundlers coming up. And it's this mainstream uh, core part of web development that everybody should know. So that's what that's bundling. Uh, like I said, I'm going to go layer by layer by layer by layer. And I'm going to help you guys understand fully what this application does walking up into phaser. So now we have index.js. And in index.js, um, we have, uh, the first thing we're doing is we're doing const phaser equals requires phaser. And that brings in phaser.js. Now we're using phaser.js, which is a really cool library um, that lets me do stuff like this. And let me grab uh, phaser.js. Here's another example. Here's a bit more of a mature example of what phaser can do. Um, I can show you guys more examples as well of what Phaser is capable of. So, oh, that looks that looks interesting. Um, let's see. Let's go to Ellipse, and let's let's do clone. So here's here's another thing that Phaser is capable of doing, and it'll let you do that relatively easily. So in about 54 lines of code, not much math, like a little bit. Um, it'll let you create um, patterns like this one. But that's not all, of course, because phaser.js is a full game library. And what it'll let you do in addition to that, it'll actually let you build full games, of course, which is why we're here. Um, here's a breakout built in phaser.js. Okay, here's a breakout. So I click and I can play breakout. And if you guys don't stop me, I'm gonna keep playing this. Um, but yeah, yeah. So here's uh, here here's some of what Phaser is capable of doing. And Phaser lets you build breakout in about 140 lines of code. So very powerful and very easy to read as well. Um, Here's uh, here's kind of how you work with Phaser. You know what? I'm not going to walk you through this. I'm going to walk you through our example. So you guys can take a look at the, the breakout example if you want on your own time. Uh, I'll drop it in, um, in Zoom so people have it. But I'm going to go back to our example over here. And what I'm doing is I have a, I have a ball that, oh. I, I stopped my bundler, so that's why it stopped. So I'm going to do npm. I'm going to go back to package.json. And instead of build, I'm going to make it do serve again. So now it'll start my server. And that's how localhost 1234 comes into being, is it's thanks to uh, and localhost 3000 and 8080 or whatever else you're used to, um, that it comes from the bundler. And as soon as you're done building, um, how's everybody doing? Uh, do you want me to pick up the pace? Is this going too slow? Is this too abstract, too theoretical? Want me to get uh, down in the nitty gritty? Do you want me to go more abstract? How am I doing? Good, bad? Anybody who doesn't want me to do what I'm doing right now? Good, OK, OK. OK, anybody who wants me to change anything, let me know. If you have any questions, drop them. If you have questions that are more abstract and not related to this, drop them too, because there's going to be times when I'm, I'm going to be paused, and I can answer your questions at that point. Um, 
Okay, so localhost 1000, uh, uh, lo localhost just automatically reloaded. So I'm the white ball and I'm able to bounce around and I'm also able to uh, shoot bullets. And there's a bit of lag, but I promise you it gets better once you, uh, once you do a build. Uh, there's a question, can we just NPM install phaser or do we need to use the version you provide? Um, you can either clone, you, you, there, there, there's no mandate. As long as you're not using Unity or some kind of game development framework, you're good. Um, don't, don't use Unity or anything like that and you'll be fine for the hackathon. Um, you can clone the project or you can start from scratch. So it's totally up to you. You don't have to fork. You can, you can definitely start from just scratch. Uh, if you do install, um, if you do clone this project, then make sure that you don't screw around with the versions too much. Maybe you can change the version, but don't don't screw around with it too much, and uh, it, it'll just break stuff. Anyway, uh, coming back to here, um, all of this gets started that gets kickstarted in index.js, and it gets kickstarted first by setting config. And in config, I am setting the type, which is phaser.auto. Um, this will use WebGL if WebGL is available. Otherwise, it'll use Canvas. Um, you set the width and the height of the scene. Um, you set the uh, preload, create, and update lifecycle hooks. And I can go into what those do. You tell phaser that you need a physics engine. You need the uh, you need the physics engine to be of type arcade, and FPS is about sixty, and Y gravity is two thousand. So if I set, for example, Y gravity to zero, and I go back here and wait for it to load, and as you can see, uh, Y gravity is now just totally gone, and I now have instead of a um, instead of a you know a um, an earthbound action game, you now have, maybe this is top down or maybe this is a space-based action game. I don't know. Maybe these circles can be turned into tanks and you can make the tanks accelerate. I don't know. Uh, whatever you want to build, you're going to be able to build starting from the template that I, I'm giving you. So if you want to build a space-based action game, set gravity to zero and you'll be able to do this. If you want to build um, something that has a sideways, like, like everything sticks to the left side, you can set gravity X as well. And you can change gravity settings um, just by going in here and changing a few different variables. This is why I love using um, game engines. Blood cell fight, there you go. Um, this is why I love using game engines is because they give so much out of the box. You can also set friction. If you want to really slow things down, you can also set friction um, which will decay the velocity over time for all of these objects. Um, one thing that would be neat if anybody wants a challenge is um, making an orbit game. Now, PhaserJS doesn't come out of the box with uh, orbital um, me mechanisms. It's fully capable of doing it. Um, but you'd have to basically set an X, Y coordinate for the sun and the planets would go spinning around those and a spaceship would go spinning around the sun. But um, PhaserJS is not that advanced. Um, but yeah, you guys, wanna, you guys wanna make sure that... Uh, Ryan just asked a question. I got a fork loaded locally. When I fire bullets, it slows down to like less than one FPS. Yep. Um, I think the best way to solve that on your local is to just shrink the screen and there's a bit of funky stuff that's happening. Um, and I'll show you how to debug your video game as part of the session. And I'll show you how to debug your performance. I'll show you how to debug um, your, uh, your, your code. I, I'll show you how to set a breakpoint because when you're building video games, it's super important to do that. Um, then I pass it into game config and we're good. Now, we're, we're, we have these lifecycle hooks create, preload, and update. Um, I kept those inside the lifecycle folder. So create gets, this create is the thing that gets uh, immediately triggered when you, when you create a new, um, uh, a new phaser app. So when you, when you boot up your browser, I mean, that's when create gets triggered. So inside create, 
Um, one thing to note is the lifecycle hooks, they have to be full functions. They can't be arrow functions. See you, Ryan. Um, I'll be uploading this to um, uh, YouTube so you can watch this later. So one of the things that you want to be careful about is don't use arrow functions on phaser because they won't work. So phaser and react are very different. Phaser does not like arrow functions a lot. There are deeper reasons for that, but just don't use arrow functions. Just use old fashioned functions for phaser um, and you'll be good. So uh, the first thing I'm doing is I'm creating a ball and the ball is um, at X coordinate 300 Y coordinate 400, and it's of width 30 and it's of height 30. So it's an ellipse. So 30, 30 makes it a uh, circle and it's white in color. So this is our white player object. And I'm adding it to the physics engine. Um, this this.physics.add makes the object come alive and it adds it to the physics engine so that it can move around and interact with things around it. Um, then I'm adding the target. The target is the red ball. And I'm setting it at a random X, a random Y. I'm setting it at 30, 30. And uh, I'm setting the width and height to be 30, 30. Now, if I set this to, let's say, 50, 30, or yeah, let's say 50, uh, 50, 30, then it'll reload. And you'll see that the red, the red thing is now a full out ellipse. And that's how you change the shape of the ellipse. Uh, it kind of looks like a football now. So this is how you kind of change things around in, your, in the code over here. Um, then what I'm doing is I'm setting the x velocity and the y, the y velocity. One thing to note on these physics-based objects, uh, all of them have a body property. And target.body is, um, is what you have to work with. Um, to set physics related properties. So target is the ball, but the ball's body is what determines the velocity, is what does collision detection. Uh, it's the physics body that's attached to the, to the visual of the circle. So if you were to, uh, you know that spiral example that I just showed you guys? If you were going to create art using phaser, you might not even want physics engines. So you might not even use body. But because we're building a game and it's a physics-based game, uh, body is a physics body that actually interacts with everything, does edge detection, collision detection, all that. So as you can see, I'm creating the ball over here. I'm creating the player. I'm creating the target. And then or at the bottom, I'm just telling the physics engine, hey, um, for, the, for the whole world, set walls. And the walls should uh, start at 0, 0. So it's like a square box at 0, 0. And it should extend to the width and the height of the scene. So a bit of, uh, a bit of bookkeeping over there. Um, like a, a bit of just uh, boilerplate over there to set walls for the scene. Because um, PhaserJS also has a camera. So you can also move the camera around. Um, so I'm not, I, didn't, I didn't create a camera-based game. I just created a square-based game. But you can absolutely move a camera around the world. So if you want to create a massive game world and center it on the player, then you can, have, uh, you, can have, um, you can build a game that does that. Now, preload is empty, um, but update is interesting. Now, how a game engine works is there's a tick. There's, a, there's an update loop that happens very, very quickly. And the update function over here is that update loop triggering. And this update function gets triggered um, more than 60 times in a second. So it's like rapid fire, really, really fast. Um, at every single step of the, update, um, of the update loop running, the physics engine first does its thing, and then it lets you do modifications on top of it. So um, what, what I'm doing over here is I'm creating uh, cursor keys for input. I'm checking if the left button is pressed down. And this happens multiple times a second. If the left uh, button is pressed down, then I ask the player to move left. If the right button is pressed down, um, I ask the player to move right. Uh, Johnny said generally runs once per 16 milliseconds. That sounds like. 60 frames per second. So that sounds like 60 FPS. 
Cool, gotcha. Uh, thanks for that useful info. So um, depending on which button I press, the player moves up, down, left, right. Um, and if I click with my mouse, then the player shoots the bullet in that direction. So that's how this whole uh, game works. And, and I've used object-oriented code. So I'm going to go into player. And I'm going to show you guys how I built uh, the player. So the player exists on the world. And the world is this little object that contains the player. And it also contains the target. Uh, um, well, CPU is unused. Little technical debt over there. CPU is actually unused. It actually gets set on target. So heads up, my bad. Um, world is just. And uh, it, it's just an object on which everything stays so that we can easily reference it. So it's a singleton. The, the world is a singleton that I've used for convenience. Um, and you can see that the world is uh, uh, the, the world is created inside create. So we import the world and we set the player back in the create function when the game boots up. That's where we're setting the player on the world. And that's where world kind of comes in. And then we're referencing world again in update. So we get the player back from the world, and then we check what's happening, and then we tell the player what to do. Now, what is what is the player? Uh, the player is just a ball. And uh, what is the target? The target is also just a ball. Um, so the player and the target are both balls. And the player is just controlled by the keyboard, and the target is not controlled at all, uh, which is how um, uh, which is how I've structured my code. That gives us a few advantages. If I go into objects, I can I can see that ball is an object. That gives us a few advantages. So if you wanted to create AI and you wanted your target to shoot back at the player, then you'd be able to build that um, simply using the existing um, the, the existing ball code. Uh, so an update, you know where it says player dot shoot pointer. So I'm I'm asking the player to shoot at the pointer. If you wanted um, the target to shoot at the player, then you would just do uh, uh, target.shoot player, and that should just work. So there's uh, the way I've, I've structured it is it's going to make it easy for you. So going into ball, uh, the ball class extends phaser's own ellipse class. And first, it does super just passes, uh, pa passes the scene and the arguments into super. Um, and then it sets this.initialized false, um, just to let the code know um, that it's false, uh, that, that the, the thing is not initialized. Then I add, um, th then it adds the ball into the scene. So this is stuff that I pulled out of phasers documentation. Um, and I've created this for you, and I'll show you guys shortly how to work with the documentation too. Because Phaser, you have to work with the documentation, but you also have to know how to debug, and you also need to know how to work with examples. And I, and, and it's a little tricky, and that's where you're going to get a lot of value. So stick around with me for a little bit. I'm going to zip through this. I'm going to show you guys quickly what this code does, and then I'm going to go into actually how to debug Phaser how to work with documentation, how to use examples, where to find examples, uh, how not to trip yourself up, because Phaser has two live versions. There's v2 and there's v3, and they're very different. So how to find v3 examples and not get tripped up on v2 examples. So this is stuff that we've done a lot of Phaser JS hackathons in the past. This is stuff that developers get tripped up on all the time. So I'll go through this stuff. Um, coming back to the ball class. Um, so the ball class, I've added certain functions. I've extended the ellipse class, and I've added left, right, up, and down. And what, what left, right, up, and down do is they get the body for the ball. So this dot body, that's the physics body that I referred to earlier. And then it sets the velocity. It sets x velocity, y velocity. And, and PhaserJS is so beautiful. I've built games where I had to manage that myself. And it was so much work just to get that going. But PhaserJS just manages velocity and updating uh, updating position for you based on velocity. So it's really cool. Um, let me pause right here. And I know that that was a lot to take up. Um, how's everybody doing? If you have a question, just unmute and ask me the question or drop it in chat. Um, can I have a, can, can I have a, I'm doing good, getting bored, not doing so good. 
can I kind of have a, a, a general feel for how everyone is doing? Kendall is good. Bavia is good. Uh, Julio, trying to keep up. Okay, talk to me. Uh, what's uh, what's fuzzy for you right now? Because if it's fuzzy for you, it's fuzzy for at least a few other people. Ah, new syntax. Okay. Uh, Bavia, the phaser version is uh, version 3. So we're not using version 2. We're using version 3. Um, so Julio, this is all just new syntax and all. Okay. Um, what what part of the syntax is new? Is it uh, the class-based stuff? Is that what's tripping you up, Julio? Here, I'll unmute for a second. There's like jackhammering happening at the bottom of my building, so I was keeping it muted. It's just all um, like I'm, I'm slowly wrapping my head around it. What, what it's actually saying is pretty simple. Um, I'm just trying to, you know, like it's already built out and I have to refer to documentation to really get my head around it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, if, if you start getting, if you start falling behind, could you let me know? Because other people are going to be falling behind too. Yeah, sure thing. Cool. Thanks. Perfect. So uh, coming back over here, um, you have left, right, up and down. And uh, the way that that works is, um, it doesn't move the ball, it just accelerates the ball. And then physics kind of the gravity sets in and then it, it does its own thing. Bouncing sets in, does its own thing. All of that stuff is just handled by phaser. I don't have to worry about it. All I'm doing is I'm increasing the velocity based on the acceleration. So I've just set acceleration to 40. It's an arbitrary value. You can change that to speed up acceleration and speed it down. So if I set it to like something crazy like uh, Let's say not not a thousand. Let's say two fifty. Then you'll see how that starts modifying. Oh my gosh, so slow. Manual refresh. All right. So now if I do up, notice how it was just like super quick. If I do right, it's like just super quick, and I can zip around, and it's. Uh, it really changes the feel of the game. Now, when you're designing a game, when you're building a game, you really want to slow down your acceleration or you want to speed it up depending on, depending on what kind of game you want to build. The acceleration has a massive impact on gameplay. Like it just totally changes the feel of the game. So this is something that you can use to make your game either uh, faster paced or um, set certain yeah, make it make it feel different for the user. Uh, the acceleration is uh, global for the ball, but not for the bullet. So notice how the bullet didn't accelerate quite as fast. So acceleration is global for the ball, but not for the bullet. So it's for the ball class. Uh, so so then we move down to shoot. Now shoot is. Um, I'm actually really proud of this little shoot thing. I've worked a lot on the shoot uh, function. It took me a while to figure it out. Um, you put a target into shoot, and the target is any object, including your pointer, so including your cursor. And um, you create uh, what, what the shoot button does is it adds a bullet to to physics. And then this does seem that physics are not existing. Um, it just adds a bullet. Now, what's a bullet? Bullet comes from the other object file, which is bullet. And in the constructor, as you can see, um, when you add the bullet, you have an origin and you have a target. And this is the player, and target is the is uh, the pointer. So over here, player is you know the ball. That's the player. And pointer is actually my mouse cursor, but it doesn't have to be like this. So this is overly specific naming of variables. This is an anti-pattern. Um, I was trying to get this done in time for the Learnathon. So this is an anti-pattern that I'm kind of like making you guys aware of. Uh, player can be anything, and pointer can be anything. And the bullet doesn't even need to know that it's starting from the player and is going to the pointer. So renaming this in production, I would insist that player be renamed to origin and pointer be renamed to target. 
but this is in production. Um, and you guys have a learnathon to start on. So let's let's keep going. Uh, it initializes it. And right now, one little hack that I did, which isn't really that great, is I set a timeout where after um, half a second elapses, this bullet gets destroyed. So if you want to remove an object from phaser, you do you do object.destroy. Um, but I'm not happy with it because this is not how phaser recommends you do it. Phaser recommends you do this inside the game loop or by creating a game object and then deleting it from the game object. So there are a couple of ways to do it. And um, I, can I can kind of start going into it. This is probably why uh, the lag is happening is my bet. So this is probably where the lag is happening. And then it just, inside the constructor, it just adds, uh, this is boilerplate again. So for every single uh, phaser object, the first constructor par parameter is always seen. And then you have uh, whatever uh, wh whatever variables you put in. Um, and then in the pre-update, this is it, this just runs once before initialization. Um, I'm doing physics.move to object. So I'm I, this is this line is where um, is where we're setting the angle and the speed, the initial speed of the uh, um, of the bullet. So Johnny just said, I think phaser prefers you having a lifespan parameter and subtract it for per update loop. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So I wasn't able to get around to that. So I left my little hack in there. But in order to work with phaser, I think it's kind of a good thing. I think you, it'll give you guys um, a, a bit of a, an exercise to work on in learning how to, how to work with phaser and refactoring code. Um, here's the thing about Mintbean. Mintbean is semi-academic. So you have academic settings that you're coming out of or you're learning stuff from tutorials they're not going to give you technical debt to deal with. They're not going to give you fuzzy areas in code that you have to fix up. Um, the first time you encounter that is when you get it. Is when you get a job challenge, when you get a technical challenge from a from a possible job, asking you to find the bugs and fix them. Um, so Mintbean's entire um, goal is to help you find that first job, is to bridge that gap from graduation to hire, and I feel absolutely okay giving you guys code with little um, duct tape patches on it because it'll help you guys to actually learn how to deal with those duct tape pat patches and become better developers. So that's my excuse, but there's also a large uh, grain of truth in there. So uh, first thing you might want to do is figure out instead of set timeout, how do I, how do I decrement a counter? And after the counter has been decremented, how do I delete that? Two ways to do it, either create the bullets inside index.js or, um, sorry, inside uh, uh, update.js. So create the bullets over here. That's one, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is you create a, a group in phaser and you add the bullet to the group and you work with the group. Now I haven't done that for you, but it's not super hard to figure out and don't worry about where to put what, don't worry about what file to put what in, just start working with it. Don't worry too much about how to organize it. Um, just get it to work and have fun with it and, and, and worry about the details later. But definitely the set timeout is where the lag is coming from. And maybe, uh, maybe if people are stuck on this on Monday, I can, I can step in and help people out uh, to get that lag out of their games. Another way to get the lag out of your game is to just delete bullet altogether and not have bullets at all. So coming back to, um, you'll notice at the end, there, there's this game object factory dot register ball. Uh, this is what lets, um, th this register ball is what lets you do this dot add dot ball. So this dot add dot ball is being added by that game object factory at the bottom of each file. There's one at the at the bottom of uh, bullet as well. And Nickel said you could probably get away with not destroying the bullet. I found that that actually didn't work. So maybe the set timeout is actually not the source of the bottleneck. Maybe the bottleneck comes from somewhere else. But it'd be interesting. Uh, as a community, we can get together and debug that together. So let's do this. We have about 40 people who are looking at this. Um, 
if somebody figures out where, where the lag is coming from, post that in Discord and we'll work with it together. In the meantime, I'll try and work, work with it too and see if I can figure it out. Um, Johnny said, you can actually recycle bullets instead of creating a new bullet. That's another way to do it too. Yeah, absolutely. You're right, Johnny. So um, that's really great. Like the community is starting to talk. You guys are starting to talk to each other and trying to figure out things together. Um, there's no such thing as cheating over here. Just you guys can talk to each other across teams. You guys can talk to each other and try and help each other and get answers as well. So it is a learnathon. It's not a straight up hackathon. It's not super competitive. So definitely just um, help each other out and talk about this stuff inside uh, Discord as well. Anywho, that's kind of that's kind of how uh, the whole thing is structured. I don't want to harp more on the code because it's starting to get dull for me too. Um, I'm going to go into debugging now. So a couple of things you want to learn how to do is set breakpoints. Uh, this is the debugger uh, keyword, and when you're working with um, when, you're, when you're working with uh, Phaser.js, being able to set a debugger is actually super, super, super helpful. Um, what do I mean by that? So let's say I go into ball.js and I forgot that uh, pre-update, it should be if this dot not initialized and I screwed up over there. And I go back and let's see what the effect of that is. It's probably gonna slow down a lot. So the effect of that is there's just there's just like it's not it's not clinging to the wall. It's not bouncing off the walls. That stuff is not happening uh, because collide world bounds was never set to true. Now trying to dig through your code, figuring out what the hell went wrong, you haven't. <clears throat> you're, you're, most of you are not experts on Phaser, so you're gonna want to use every single debug tool at your disposal to figure out what's wrong. And one of the most powerful tools is the debugger. Now, if you go into source sources in your network tab, uh, in your sorry sources in your console, make sure that this deactivate breakpoints is off. Uh, blue means off, and gray means sorry. Blue means on, and gray means off. Make sure it's off. Uh, if you go over here and you set a debugger, then what that'll do is the next time that function gets called, is going to stop the browser in its tracks immediately. So boom, it just paused. Nothing's going to happen until I move forward. And now I have a remote control that lets me step-by-step step move over the code, which is really, really damn cool. So look what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say step over next function call. So now it's moved to the next line and I'm gonna keep going. So it says, if this dot initialized, so is it initialized? No, it's not. So I hovered over it and it says this dot initialized is false. And the condition clearly says if it's true, then deal with it. So so then that, that gets me thinking, oh, well, maybe if I just press, uh, maybe if I just set um, this to not, maybe if I just add the um, exclamation mark, then it'll work. So that's a way to trace down exactly what went wrong with your code. Uh, who's never used a debugger? Anybody never used a debugger? Never ever? Uh, yeah, never like this. I think the ones I've uh, had have been in like the um, the code editor where you just drop like a little uh, breakpoint on the side of the line. And like that's where it, it stops. You can put a bunch of them down and you know step to the next one or step over each line like you were just showing. Gotcha, okay. And uh, a lot of people um, are also saying no, that that would be a first time for them. So I'll kind of break it down for them. So a debugger is super powerful, as you can see. Uh, one of the main features is that remote control that lets you, lets you step next, next, next. Um, in order for the breakpoint to execute, there are two preconditions, three preconditions. One is the console has to be open. Doesn't matter what tab you're on, the console needs to be open. The second precondition is breakpoints need to be activated. So don't press, make sure this isn't blue, make sure it's gray. And the third thing is a debugger breakpoint, a breakpoint needs to be set. So this thing, debugger is a breakpoint that I've set. Another way to set a breakpoint is I can actually 
click the gutter, the line number, and I can set breakpoints in the code. And these actually persist. Um, and uh, they persist between refreshes. As long as your file hasn't changed, it persists. So look here, um, I just caught, I, I, I just caught the, um, the code in the constructor for the ball and now it's paused. And at this point I can go in there and I can see my entire scope. Like let's, 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 let's kind of expand this and let's, let's look at this, let's look at what's going on. I have um, the entire scope and inside the scope, um, I have the arguments of the current function 300, 400, 30, 30, et cetera. I have, um, I have the args variable. I have the scene variable. That's, that's that scene over here. I have the this variable. I can click this and then the ball, um, now I can see what properties exist on the ball. Uh, I can click on the property to, if, if it says triple dot to load it up. And then not only can I see what's going on um, step by step, but I can also go up the closure scopes. So you can kind of see what's in closure scope. Not only that, if this is kind of alien to you, the easiest way to actually deal with this is I can go to console and I can type scene. And that's the scene variable that's, um, that, that's on this line right here. So it's the exact same scene variable. And I can actually go into console, type scene. I can do scene dot. And I get autocomplete, and I can see all of the different properties and, and functions of scene. I can do scene.data. I can do scene.data.events. And all of this stuff is, it depends on what, uh, what scope I'm in. Uh, thanks, Johnny. You take care. If I do this, it tells me what this is. If I do this dot, it tells me stuff that's on the ball itself. So if I do this dot down, then now I have access to my source code that I wrote. So I can do this dot down, this, I, I, I can absolutely even call the function. Um, of course, it'll screw up because um, the body hasn't been initialized right now, but I can actually start calling functions and I can actually start calling um, uh, calling methods. I can even change properties on ball. So if this dot X um, is zero, I can then do this dot, this dot x equals 100. And then if I do this dot x after that, it'll be updated and it'll actually stick in live code. So this is how you can start debugging interactively with your JavaScript code. And this just knocks the socks off of uh, console.log. I mean, why do you need console.log if you have this? Um, and I can't remember the last time I used console.log. It might've been just to make sure that, that I, I use console.log so rarely now. I do use it once in a while, but so rarely. And I just use the debugger because it's way more powerful. So one of the things that I'll caution you is console.log won't get you far in this hackathon because of phaser. So familiarize yourself with debugger and it will help you. If you're in a group, this can be stuff that you guys do in a group. And this uh, these dev tools are really helpful um, as you can see. Uh, other stuff you can do uh, you can do with it is you can also um, you can also manipulate the DOM, so you can get the document object, and you can you can start going to document, and um, you can um, you can set the inner HTML of the document to LOL. I mean, if you really wanted to, and that'll definitely take. Um, I think it's document body probably inner HTML equals LOL, and that'll take. And you can you can do all sorts of stuff. While you're, while there's a breakpoint, while it's paused in debugger, and then you just press the play button, and it goes to the next debugger. And you press the play button, and it goes to the next debugger. And you press the play button, and it goes to the next debugger. So it's really, 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 really helpful. I uh, hope this was useful. Uh, the other thing that I want to uh, tell you guys about is how to deal with Phaser's documentation and how to work with Phaser. First caveat: Phaser JS has V2 and V3. So phaser, uh, um, phaser v2 is very different. And if you look in the URL, um, example slash v2 is, um, is clearly a version two example. And this is the phaser two examples board. Do not go here if you're using my template because it'll screw you up. 
Um, Phaser V2 is old. It has very different API, and it'll definitely uh, trip you up. So don't go there. Uh, instead, um, click on Examples, and that'll take you to Phaser 3 Examples. And this is where you can start searching for snippets of code that'll help you do what you're looking for. So let's say I wanted to add a sprite sheet. Right? So if I, if I type sprite, um, now I can go in here and I can click on, um, let's say, create animation on sprite. So I can go here. And you can see that these little soldiers are animated now. And the sprites are animated. And you can you, you have all the code you need, all the examples you need over here. Um, on create, it's adding an image. Uh, Rambo, it's adding soldier for Rambo. Rambo.anims.create is how you add keyframes uh, for the soldier. And then you can add keyframes for everybody else. And then you click play to walk. And you add that sprite um, into the scene. So that's how you create a sprite sheet that looks a bit more impressive. Um, so that's how you find examples. But finding examples is only half the story. There's also documentation. And PhaserJS is kind of weird and funky as well. So um, I found while building this example project, I was going between my debugger and uh, phaser examples and documentation. So don't try and learn PhaserJS from scratch. PhaserJS is more like a kitchen sink um, or like a refrigerator from which you can pull out all these ingredients and then chop them together. Um, do not do not follow. Uh, you, you should definitely not uh, look at PhaserJS as something that you need to learn from the ground up. It's best learned through examples and screwing around with examples and copying and pasting code because it is so powerful. All you have to do is just copy paste some code, drop it in your uh, project and um, It'll just uh, it'll it, it, it'll just be way easier for you that way. Uh, John asked, "How would you debug something that is somewhere in the middle of the game state?" Uh, could you um, could you explain what you mean by that, John? Like like when you drop in that debugger, um, you know how you couldn't call the ball function because it wasn't initialized yet. But like yeah, like. Things need to run, and then the bug happens. Like you want to find those game, those states, but like, can you give do, me a concrete? You know I mean? No, I like, don't. Like, 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 um, when you're showing um the example of your debugger, like it's only gonna stop on the first call of the function, but but this thing's running, you know, sixty times per second, and you're not actually getting to the game state that you want to actually debug until. Ah, okay, great question. Yes, there is a way to do that. So let's say, um, let let's say I'm in. Uh, oh, if you do command P inside the sources, you can actually go between files, just like in uh, VS Code. So let's get, let's say we go to update. Now what I can do is, of course, I can set the breakpoint, but that's not helpful because now it's just gonna pause all the time. So let let's see what that looks like. Uh, sources and then it's gonna yeah that's just pre update that'll run oh gosh let me let me take that debugger off uh, I can take that off now what's gonna happen hopefully is it's gonna get caught on update and now it's caught on update and every time I, I press play. Uh, like John said, or John anticipated, um, it gets, I, I, it's not very helpful because this thing gets updated so frequently. So if you want to break on a certain game state, um, let's say you want it to break um, if left dot is down, then you want it to break, but you didn't want to, or, or if, if down dot is down, then you want to break, but you, you don't want to break here. You want to break at the top because there's some other stuff that, that, that depends on when your keyboard is pressing down. And um, what you can do is you can add a conditional breakpoint. And if you do conditional breakpoint, then you can do um, up dot is down. And that's a conditional breakpoint. And I'm going to release that. And now you know everything is normal, but I'm going to press down. Well, should have worked. Um, let me let me uh, 
try it again. Oh, one, one step below that. So add a conditional breakpoint. So up dot is down. So now I'm I'm going to go back here and I'm gonna press up and that pauses it. And then continue. And you can kind of silence it because the um, when you press up, it actually stays down for a little period of time. So you silence it, let it go, unsilence it, and then I guess the conditional breakpoint actually sticks. So if it gets triggered once, then it'll get triggered uh, again and again. So that conditional breakpoint is um, you, you you just set it and then it'll it'll start triggering it. So it'll only activate the breakpoint if the condition is met once. So that's how you can get around that. Another way to get around that, um, that might be maybe a bit more useful or fluid is you can actually do if up dot is down, then debugger. So that's another way to do it. And that, this is probably the reason why debugger exists in the code, because sometimes you want to debug based on conditions. All right, so um, now I kind of showed you how to um, how to go through documentation. Uh, then you can go to documentation. You know what? I'm not going to go through documentation, but how I kind of do it is phaser.js v3. If I wanted to get, say, um, ellipse, phaser.js v3, I'll just Google it and I'll, I'll scan until I see phaser.gameobjects.ellipse on the phaser3 docs. And here's a phaser3 three docs. Uh, you can go through the docs and you can find documentation for the stuff that you're using over here. It's heavy duty documentation. It's object oriented heavy duty documentation, um, but it can be very helpful. And you can start looking at documentation from uh, as a third resource. Don't look at documentation as your first go-to. Look at documentation as your last resource to start drilling into what's happening. Another way to uh, look at documentation is um, uh, very often, if, if you structure your code right, and I did not, um, you, can, you can hover over stuff inside VS Code, and it'll give you um, the documentation for the library. If you hover over this.scene, this.scene.physics, it'll give you that documentation. And it'll tell you what the object name is. This one is arcade physics. So then I can go, I can take physics.arcade.arcadephysics and I can drop that here. I can search for it, nothing. I can then kind of go and just look for arcade physics. Boom, arcade physics is here. So if I wanted to know exactly, um, exactly what that object was, whatever that object was over here, this scene.physics, if I wanted to know exactly what that object was, then I would trace it down by looking at the TypeScript type on the top right. So that's physics.arcade.arcadephysics. Look for arcade physics. Make sure that this, uh, what they call a qualified namespace works and, and is an exact match. And then there's all sorts of information about arcade physics, about the whole object. There's all sorts of information. And learning how to read documentation over time, if you, if you don't get it the first time, don't fret. But learning how to deal with this over time kind of makes you a much better developer. And uh, that's all I got. Uh, I lost a few people over here because this was pretty heavy and this went on for a while. Um, I'll take last parting questions. We have um, the Dev Collective Town Hall coming up in 23 minutes. And if you'd like to get involved in the community, get direct mentorship from me, um, let me know. And I do career mentorship too. I happen to be really damn good at career mentorship in addition to technical mentorship. If you'd like to uh, barter where you come and get mentorship from me in return for doing something for the community, um, we can talk about it in the Dev Collective uh, Town Hall in about 20 minutes. I need water. Navi, over <laughs> to you. Uh, any last questions, drop them in the Zoom chat. I'll be right back. I got to get some water. That was a lot of information, guys. Um, <laughs> how are you all feeling? Let's do a pulse check. <laughs> Let me first of all remove Monarch as the spotlight. And uh, we need to do an update on his photo. Um, it kind of looks like, how do I, how do I, 
uh, withdraw code? No. I have no idea how to remove him from Spotlight. So we're just going to see his wonderful face uh, <laughs> with the Christmas lights. How's everyone feeling? Um, I wouldn't say overwhelmed, <laughs> but like knowing that I have um, a lot to look over before I can start. I already have the template um, copied over and testing it, but there's definitely a lot, a lot to go through. Yeah, it just feels like a lot of proper, proper, uh, preparation and need like you know, research that needs to be done looking over docs, but otherwise I feel excited. Did you guys find this helpful? Um, we're trying. We're trying something new. We used to. We used to leave a lot of this information in the Kanban, and then sort of expect like, you know, you all to do the heavy lifting to go. But there's a lot. There's a lot, right? When you're unpacking a new library or unpacking a new framework, there's a lot of nuances that sometimes can easily go over. Um, so we're trying. We're trying a new format to make it a little bit easier. Um, we noticed this sort of this thing that happens with um, with participants in the Learnathon, like we'll see, you know, X number of people who've registered for the event and then we'll see, you know, 50% drop off like when, when they come and actually attend. And then we'll see like a significant people drop off from the submission, right? Um, the whole purpose of starting Mint Bean and like creating this framework was so that you actually have projects to showcase uh, at the end of it. So we wanna make sure that we're setting up everyone for success. And, and this is sort of, I see a raised hand. Kendall, what's up? Sorry, I didn't wanna interrupt you. I was waiting to press it at the right time. Um, I just wanted to know what's like the, so for all this information, what is the best place to see like the rules, so to speak, or like the um, parameters for this specific project, like what the ultimate goal is that we're trying to do with this, um, as well as things just like how many people you should have strive for per team or things like that. Like, is, is there one of those pages that we have the links to that is the best one to go to for that? Uh, great question. So I'll add that to the Kanban board. So you'll find that in the Kanban board. Um, the goal of the hackathon to summarize is um, there's a there, there's a core functionality that you've been provided. Go crazy! So this is totally creative, open ended. You guys can build whatever you want as long as it's an action game. It doesn't even need to be a physics based game as long as it's an action game. So I hope that answer is what we're building. Uh, you have seven days to build it. You can you can be in teams of one, two, or three. Uh, if you are in a team of one. Make sure that you guys are, if, if you're really good and confident and you want to go it alone, do it alone and go for it. But if you're not confident, um, I find that a lot of people who are not confident end up not joining a team because they think they have nothing to contribute. And what am I going to do joining a team? Don't be that person. Uh, last week, MSAD um, uh, helped a couple of people out in the, in the community who are going to drop off. And Emsa, thanks for doing that and being a great member of the community. And um, they, they basically were going to drop out because they didn't want to be a burden on anybody and they thought the hackathon was too hard for them. And what ended up happening was they joined, I think it was they joined MSAT's group, I think. And uh, they just ended up having a, a, a lot of fun in a group setting instead of doing it alone. Um, or maybe I'm screwing it up, MSAD. I'm not sure if that was entirely factu factually accurate, but I'm pretty sure that you helped them. Um, but, but, the, but the thing that I'm trying to say over here is when, when, you, uh, when you join a group, even if you contribute just a little bit at your level, that's totally fine. Some people are gonna be stronger than you. Some people are gonna be weaker than you. If you find yourself in a group where you're the smartest person, um, I ask that you teach the others and you share your knowledge openly with the others. If you find yourself in a group where you're the weakest person, I ask that you learn and you stay out of uh, the team's way, but you, you contribute in whatever small way you can and learn from the other team, uh, the other team members. Yeah, I was gonna say something on that note. Um, so let's say if you feel like, oh, like there's no way I can do this, right? Um, you can join a team and say, I'm gonna build your landing page. Um, so I, I feel like I, I missed a few steps in orientation, 
Um, building a landing page in itself is a really great way of showcasing that, uh, that portfolio piece. We actually recently hired um, a developer on the team. He built, um, he built this, uh, was it Conway's Game of Life? Or I think it was maybe another portfolio piece. And I was going over it with him and I'm like, I don't really understand how to use uh, this portfolio piece that you've built. Um, if I was someone who was less technical, I might have abandoned this project and said like, okay, I, I don't, I don't fully understand the complexity of this project. I don't fully understand like, what is it exactly that you've built? So having a landing page, it's the land, the, the word landing page is used in, in marketing world where it sort of, um, gives, gives like, um, context. Right. So if someone usually the first person who lands on portfolio pieces is recruiters, um, recruiters are not developers, um, at least 90 percent of them. Um, but then, you know, you always have your unicorns, um, but they're they're pretty familiar with the tech world. But that doesn't mean that they're there that they might understand what you built. So just putting a little context to that, even if you feel like you have nothing to contribute Say, hey, I'd love to, you know, uh, just jump in and, and build a landing page for the team.